Hello and welcome to episode two of Diary of Name Dropper. I'm your host, Meredith Hepner Chapman, and my guest this week, oh, I'm so excited, honestly, is a family friend, a really good friend of my mum who she doesn't actually know him through the world of music, which was an industry she used to be in. She actually knows him through the wonderful world of dogs, which we will be discussing. My guest this week is the lead singer from one of my absolute favourite bands, The Real Thing. Chart-topping, R&B, soul, funk and controversially disco, which we'll be discussing in the episode. They are absolute legends with a brand new album out and a year of touring ahead. Welcome to Chris and Moon. Huge super fan welcome to the most amazing Chris Amu, who's known me since I was a whippersnapper. Oh, what an honor, Chris. Hello. What can I say with an introduction like that? I mean, what's a man supposed to say? Supposed oh, to say? I don't know. Just sing. <laughs> <laughs> I've known you, Chris, for gosh, as long as I can remember. People may think that. You know my mum through both being in the music industry because she was working for Decca in the late 60s, early 70s. But you don't. You know each other through the wonderful world of dogs, which we're going to come to. That was the first time I was properly starstruck when you won Crufts and then went well, on Blue Peter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you know what? I remember Blue Peter. In fact, I was only looking at some photos a couple of days ago um, because I really loved Karen. Karen was lovely, you know. We this actually, is Karen Keating. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. We actually did it the day before Crufts. And she said to me, she said, you know, if you do well, will you come back? And I says, OK, I says, you know, I'll definitely come back. And we won it the next day. We'll get to that. We'll talk about Chris's unbelievable dogs because it, it's such a the polar opposite from your life with the real thing. Yeah. And to not only be such a huge success in the music industry, but then to just casually dip your toe into dogs and basically win the best dog show in the world just says it all about Amazing. Chris Amu. <laughs> <laughs> I was going through your discography, is that the word, last night? Yeah. Obviously, we all know the big songs. Can you feel the force? Can't get by without you. You yeah. to me are everything. And when I told a few friends I was interviewing you, some very good friends, they were like, oh, my God, I'll get my disco pants out. Yeah. But, but that's a, a very popular misconception about the real thing, that you're a disco band and you're yeah. not. Yeah, I think people mistake the word disco with dance. With black music in particular, black soul music, You've always been able to dance to it, but it's not disco. Disco for me is the Bee Gees and things like that, which is totally different to uh, dancing to like the OJs and things like that, you know. Um, we always tried to come up with stuff that people could sing along to and dance along to, but it certainly wasn't disco. And I think with most bands, especially black bands, if you said to them, you disco, they'd sort of like not like it very much. It must just be because you got those massive hits in the middle of the disco era. And I think it just sort of felt, and no one's going to complain about having your records played in whatever category providing their place. But as I was saying to you last night, I'm a huge Stevie Wonder fan and it drives me mad when people go, I love Stevie Wonder. I love, I just called to say I love you. and Which he didn't even want to put on his album, you know. Basically, it was one of those songs that he did for... One of them songs that you do sometimes. <laughs> we did Let's Go Disco, which was written by Biddy. But we did it for a, a film called Stud. That's with Joan Collins. Reason, with Joan Collins. That's the only reason we did it. We never got on any of our albums. Never got anywhere. Not on any of our personal albums. We wouldn't have it anywhere near. Now, that was disco. And imagine being known for that, like Stevie Wonder is. With, he's got songs in the key of life, and he's known for... Yeah. I just got to say... I, I, I couldn't stand it. <laughs> I couldn't stand the damn song. I still can't stand it and I couldn't stand it then. No. Your music is so incredibly timeless and classic. You've got a new album out at the moment. It's a brand new day. Yeah. I love Children of the Ghetto, which you've remastered and redone for the album, which is honestly, Chris, the opening bars with that piano and your vocals. I Well, I cried and got goosebumps simultaneously. Wow. Absolutely stuff. beautiful. But A Brand New Day, the title track. Mm -hmm. We chatted about 
your love for in the past, your love for Bootsy Collins and Quincy Jones and the <laughs> Jazz Masters. And that song, A Brand New Day, has got everything from Sade to Luther. I mean, your vocals mm-hmm. in that, honestly, I'm, what helped made you write not only an album, but an album of such magnitude, of such, it's, it really feels like your best work. And I know you're super proud of it. Do you think a lot of that came from the loss of Eddie or lot? I mean, that is magic. You've just created magic in this album. And considering how big your hits are to try and surpass what you've done in the past. And you have using a very different technology. <laughs> yeah. Could you tell us a please about A Brand New Day? Because it's just it, it's already etched in my mind as a, fla- a favourite, as a classic. The, the album actually has been on our minds for a long time. And when Eddie was alive, we were always so frustrated because we were writing songs and we were taking them to record companies and basically they didn't want to know. And they were listening with half an ear. Now, most of the bands would just probably say to themselves, oh, you know, when they get knocked back after knocked back after knocked back, they'd sort of say to themselves, I can't have it anymore. I might as well go back to driving buses or something and just leave it call it a day, you know. Our hit records give us a platform to carry on and have a really good career doing what we do best, which is live performing. So Eddie and I carried on creating because we had a platform for the songs in our live show mixed with the hits. So we were always pretty frustrated when we used to, these record companies used to be putting out greatest hits, best ofs, greatest of greatest hits, and all them type of things, you know. And yet we were still here actively writing new material and it was really frustrating we didn't have the technology then to do anything about it we were under the control of record companies where if they didn't want you to be part of their stable there was no way you were going to make a record basically that was it with technology in the last five six years especially the last five six years we have been able to take control of our own recording career and not have to worry about record companies because that album I've done from home. And that's insane. Now, when Eddie was alive, although the technology was around at that point, we, the real thing, couldn't get our heads around it. It was only when Eddie died and I was having to sort of, well, Dave and myself, don't get me wrong, but I do the music side of it, was really rearranging our show. We had to do a lot with technology. And slowly but surely, the band, our musicians, was show me ways how we could do things. I'll just give you a, an example. We've always had three or four part harmony. When Ray died, the original singer of Children of the Ghetto, we had to cut down to three. And that's fine when you've got three voices. But when Eddie died, we had to cut down to two. People have always been used to this nice three part harmony in like You To Me, Sunshine, things like that. The band showed me a way of being able to still have that three part harmony mixed with our live singing. So what I did is I sung all Eddie's parts on tape. So when me and Dave were, now we're singing live, but Eddie's voice is mixed in with ours on tape. So we still got that lovely three-part harmony. So you've got Eddie's vocals on on this album. Not Eddie, not Eddie singing, but what Eddie would have sung. Oh, wow. Okay. So, you know, Eddie's singing a nice high falsetto. I can sing that. So basically I mix that in with the vocals that me and Dave are doing so that we've still got that three-part harmony and we don't need to bring in a third singer, which, number one, as far as I'm concerned, will spoil the look of the band because he's got nothing to do with the real thing. Number two, it would spoil the sound of the band because me and Dave have been singing together since we were 15 years old, you know, and Eddie not much longer than that. So we had a sound that was matured over years and years for somebody to just come in, you haven't got that sound again. No. So we were never going to do that. And the only way that we were going to really carry on was because of technology, being able to sort of keep that. Because the most important thing to me, apart from image or anything else, is our sound. What keeps me in the business is I know that I can sing better now than I could then. That keeps me in show business because people say, oh, you know, you're getting on now and this and that. Well, the thing is, is this, if you sound better now than you did then, why do you want to stop? Everything you've ever been through 
you can hear it in your voice, everything. And it's it's so raw, your singing. It's so pure and untampered with. And that is the magic of, of the real thing. And I know you're a massive fan of Earth, Wind and Fire. But actually, Ooh. I prefer your the way your harmonies are brought in because it's just got that. I know that you're just a huge Phil Bailey fan because he then went on and, and sang Children of the Ghetto. So I'm not, I'm not saying anything bad about Earth, Wind and Fire. I'm a massive, massive fan but I'm giving big love to the real thing because for you guys, I don't know whether it was the Liverpool thing or the, I, I watched some of your early Top of the Pops, some of those outfits, yeah. Chris, were pretty special. Yeah. I hope you still got them. Um, yeah. <laughs> it was the pureness. Yeah. It, was, it sounded like three super talented guys mm-hmm. from Liverpool who got together yeah. to sing from their hearts. Nothing yeah. manufactured in this world of reality. And as you said, music industry controlling everyone. I spoke to Jack yeah. on last episode, my cousin, Jack Savretti, who has only succeeded in the music industry by fundamentally sacking them off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know you've got to play the game to a certain degree, but yeah. they started controlling him. And yeah. if you want to remain integral and pure and true to yourself then Mm -hmm. it's a lot harder of a slog but if you can do it and get to where you guys are oh my god honestly chris what's worth remembering that this is if it had been left down to the record company you to me on everything would not have been the same the real thing because when we actually took it in to pi they weren't keen on it they weren't keen on the song they weren't keen on it we didn't take our version and what we what tony did our manager was he took the song in and said, this is what we're going in to record. And you what know, did you, very quickly, can I interrupt you? What did you say about yeah. Tony Hall? He was the first ever white... What he was, was he regard- white, a white producer who produced an album on Blue Note Records. That was it. Incredible. Sorry, I, 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 you told me that, and that was so interesting. I wanted to have that. Anyway, back to, back yeah. to you, to me, everything. Um, and he took it in, just the raw song. And they, they weren't keen on it. They were never going to stop us because we had... We had a lot going for us at that time. We'd been with David Essex and things. Our, our sort of audience was sort of building up. And our manager was greatly respected. So basically, we could go in and record what we wanted. Whether they released it was another thing, but we could record what we wanted. And we went in and recorded it. And within a month, it was number one. So record companies don't always know. They have this control over you. But unless you've got somebody backing you up who will stick to what you believe in. They can maybe make a few pounds for your first couple of singles or whatever, but then they're onto something else and you're left hand, right? You've got to always keep your own integrity for me with record companies. I think and I think it sells more than anything and loyal fans will see that and stick with that forever. And that's why you're still touring. One song to me that just keeps growing and makes my heart sing is someone ought to write a song about you. Yeah, oh, Chris. Do you know the problem with that was we were never allowed to sing it live on television. We got all that television surrounding our film and everything because that was actually released from our best. Time. What the company did, because we had this film for the BBC and things like that, that was a uh, televised. So this is on iPlayer now, everything, the real thing yeah. movie, which you can yeah. still find. And we're going to yeah. talk about that in a minute. The record company needed to release something. That so they could cash in on the documentary because the documentary was getting us a lot of uh, television. So therefore, you know, they wanted something to put out. They owned all our back catalogs. A company called BMG. They owned all the back catalog of like you to me can't get by and things like that. They found this someone also writes a song which hadn't been released before. So they released it as a single from the album. But you got to understand two things. Number one. They weren't bothered about the single, the record company. Remember that they weren't bothered. They were more bothered about selling the best of album. So they used that to sell the best of album. But all the TV shows like Breakfast TV, Good Morning and The One Show and all them, they wanted us to sing the old songs. So we got lots of television, but what they wanted us to sing was You To Me, Can't Get By. You To Me, Can't Get By. Which, don't get me wrong, is fantastic. I mean, television is television. But you imagine if we'd have done 
someone else to write a song on them TV shows. I think it would blow people's minds. I literally yeah. do. Yeah. We live in such a, a lazy society when it comes to music choice. People do often get led by the charts, which is yeah. why it's such a travesty that they had the power to decide that Sunshine wasn't going to be yeah. number one because I think the world missed out there. I really do. And I want everyone to listen to it. And I'm going to put all my favourite, my top 10 real thing into, into the show notes because uh, and you will compile it together and tell people what they should go and listen to because whilst, oh my God, you, you've had a very very good life on those songs I don't think they're your best I think you've got way better your music is it's up there with the great songwriters and the way people talk about you as well the way other artists talk about you I mean Billy Ocean for example Billy yeah oh my god are you are you please tell me you love your friends with Billy Ocean we broke at the same time oh both had our hits you know within the same year ish now, talking about Billy Ocean, yeah. my ex-boyfriend shared a manager with him. What was he called? Laurie with white hair and I'm trying to remember. But I remember walking down Shepherd's Bush High Street and Billy Ocean was having a meeting in like, I don't know where it was, in a really random like chicken shop or something. It was like yeah. so cool. And it's like, that's Billy Ocean. And he was, I was super starstruck. If we get him on my I- podcast, I'd be ecstatic. Mm-hmm. But He's, a, I mean, a legend. So to have him talking about your work, I mean, it just is so incredible just to even yeah. write something that the whole world can identify from hearing one mm. one or two notes from. I'd say it's probably the most wedding played song yeah. on the planet. It is, yeah. You know, Meredith, look, not many people get the opportunity to record a song like that. doesn't matter what people think. We have a habit in the music business of always... There's always something that we like better than our most popular song. Let's put it that way. And that's the same for everyone. That's just, it really is the same for everyone. Because a song like You To Me On Everything, to do what it's done and to become a classic, has got to appeal to so many ears. When you are a musician or a singer yourself, there are things that you listen for when you're listening to music that... <sighs> You to me are everything is a little bit too sweet and simplified for me, for my ear. I'm talking about as somebody talking about what I would actually want to listen to myself now. But back then I was listening to Johnny Bristol and that's where you to me came in. Because when I heard the song, I thought, that's Johnny Bristol. That could be like Johnny Bristol then. You know, hang on in there, baby. Remember that one. Same type of thing. For me, I suppose it's a little bit like Stevie Wonder with his I Just Called Say I Love You, which was what is, was it his only number one? It was, wasn't it? I, it's just so awful. It's just... Stevie Wonder is probably the best artist that he's ever been. Ever? Ever? ever. Yeah, yeah. Ever. ever. Like, yeah. My son walked through, well, I was doing research last night and I literally was just listening to all the greats from Luther, mm. did a bit of Bootsy, Listen to all of yours. I mean, just your your performance is brilliant. Feel the force. I mean, that's why people think you're disco. That was so dramatic. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. Went through quite a few stages, Feel the Force, because when we actually wrote it, um, we wrote it to end our stage show because we needed something energetic. Ah, that makes sense. And then gradually, as we were doing it, the song was building because, for instance, the audience always used to react to it. So we thought when we recorded it, we've got to have some audience noise on it to really get that sort of flavour. So that's why when you hear that, bah, da, bah, you've got like all the audience sort of shouting yeah. and things like that on it. I always remember we took it into Radio 1 and they loved it, but they said, no, it's, it's too, it's great for the dance charts, but not for radio. And it was number one in the disco charts before it even came out. So we, t- we came back out with it. Um, what we used to do on stage, before we go into it, we do this whole big thing with the lights and a synth- synthesizer before it come in. And we thought, hmm, it'd be nice to have something like that on it. So that's when um, Linton Nafe, the keyboard player, thought up that whole synthesizer beginning with all the Star Wars thing and everything. do 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 boo It's yeah. just amazing. You know, all, that, all that synth. And uh, when we took it back into Radio 1, they loved it, you know, and that's, and yeah. they, I think, who was it? Dave Lee Travis, it was. He had it as his record of the week. And you get a record of the week on Radio 1, you had it, basically. 
yeah. except for Sunshine, which was uh, which was a record the week and he held it back. But um, yeah, Force, like I say, you know, but it went through a few stages, but it started off just as a live song and then it, built up to this amazing record, really. And yeah. do you close with it? Do you still yes. close with it? Yeah. And sometimes we open with it, depends on what we're doing. If we're doing cameos like on Chill Fest and things like that, we might open with it because it gets you in straight away. Yeah. Before you're out, if you know what I mean. <laughs> because you've only got a few minutes, haven't you, to sort of get them and get yeah. off. That song immediately, whatever you're doing, my son walked through the room and he was literally like, oh, what is that? I love this. And came back in the room straight away. It was like, oh, it's yeah. such a track. It's And that's another one that I can imagine people mixing even now. Would you consider collaborating with anyone current? And if you could, who? Hmm. Put you on the spot now, Chris. I'm sorry. I mean, we, I can, I'd collaborate with, with, with a lot of people, provided I like the music. But my collaboration would be more, more a vocal thing. Like I was talking to Beverly Knight. What was that's the best name drop? I love you for yeah. name dropping Beverly Knight. Isn't she the nicest person on the planet? Yeah. And basically, we would, you know, we were talking about doing something together. But these things come about sometimes are planned, but in a lot of cases, they're dropped on you because right place, right time, right song. You know. Yeah. But Beverly Knight, I'd like to, I'd like to do a thing. Oh. I'd like you to do a thing with Beverly Knight. Um, my friend David, who is a guest on this podcast, did Bodyguard with her. I mean, she's just, she's an icon. She's our, she's our Diana Ross. Yeah, she's a fantastic singer as well. Yeah, she's great. And as you say, a lovely person too. Yeah. I'd love, that would make me so happy. We've got so much to talk about and I know that I always keep you for so long because I could talk to you till the cows come home because to, talking to you is such a joy because you are so enthusiastic and what you see is what you get. Like, you're just, yeah. that's you. It's There's no, I'm putting on Chris Amu face today to go out <laughs> on stage. There's there's none of that. It's, it's very no. much integrity and realness. How did the documentary come about? How long in the making? Basically, Simon Sheridan, the, the producer, director, he was one of a very few people who really, really believed in real thing. He's always been a fan right away from the beginning. And we were working down south. I think it was um, Croydon or one of them places we were working. And he came in, he introduced himself and said, I'd love to do a documentary because I feel that you've been airbrushed out of soul, especially soul music in this country. He says, whenever you see anything, you're not mentioned, you've not got the credit for what you've done. And he says, I think there's a story to be told. He said, I don't want you to put any money in. I will do it all myself. It's all, it's on me. He said, I just want you to access me to what you think and, you know, blah, blah, all that. And he did all the research. And we thought, you know, I didn't take it serious, to be honest with you. I thought, okay, yeah, you know, too good to be true. Anyway, about so three months later, we were staying in the hotel down south. And Eddie said, Simon Sheridan is coming in to have a chat with us. So we went down, had a chat with him, had lunch. And he pulled out all these pictures. And some of them were photos that I'd never seen before of the group, you know, performing. He pulled out a video of us when we did the UNICEF concert in Amsterdam, just after we'd done Opportunity Knox. You know, I thought, it's taken some time to get all this together. Because, I mean, this is serious business. This. I haven't seen a lot of these. And so then we started taking it serious that this guy really wanted. So we thought, OK, we'll just be as helpful as we can be. And it just grew. Basically, he'd come down. He said, right, I want to bring the film crew to each of you, stay with you for a couple of hours and do the interview. And that's when, you know, you see us talking on the documentary and things. It took three years to do, I would say. And sadly, Eddie died six months before it was completed. Oh, no. It all finished everything that we had to do. Everything about the documentary was felt was finished, but uh, Eddie didn't see it. Oh, that <coughs> sucks. Yeah, we went to see it at Simon's studio about two months, three months after Eddie died. That was the first, the rough, the rough footage of it we saw. That must have been tough. It was. It was very tough because even like watching it now, I can't really watch it a lot. I must. Admit. I was going to say. <laughs> I bet you that it must <laughs> be. <laughs> Yeah, he's in the room with you. And it's still so raw. You know, he's still, 
it, it's fantastic that we can remember him as he was then. I mean, it really is. It's, it, it's great, you know, because Eddie was a lot older than us at the main day. Is that why he joined the band late? It, it's, he, all, he, he had his own group, the chance. Um, you know, when me and Dave first saw us, we were only 15. So basically, we had our own thing, and the chance were old hats to me and Dave. <laughs> you know, we were like sort of, they were doing the cabaret sort of thing. We were like into all the temptations, either, but the real hip cloud nine and all that. It was, you know, after it's grown and all that, this is when they're into Papa was a Rolling Stone and things like that. And we were coming up on that, you see. So basically, Eddie showed me the basics. You know, he used to show us parts, get the singing harmonies. Gradually, I learned to be able to do it. And we started writing songs. I started writing me little ditties. Then I'd play them to Eddie and he'd say, no, try this, Chris, try this. And get them, you know, till they were like quite reasonable songs. Nevertheless, yeah. right, we were writing together. And by the time we met Tony Hall, we were really were writing well together. Did you, you know? meet Tony through Opportunity Knox or did Tony set Opportunity Knox up? No, to- we met Tony after, during, because what happened was we were managed by two guys in Liverpool who, once again, you know, sometimes in life you meet people who, without, you know you wouldn't be in the position you are now. And these two guys in Liverpool, they were agents in Liverpool and they used to book a lot of the clubs in Liverpool. They used to book a lot of the, the rock acts and things around Liverpool. And we used to go in for these talent competitions, you know, that were in the paper, in the local paper. And one of the prizes was being introduced to these agents and they'd get you a bit of work around the clubs. Ah. Um, but they liked us that much, they took us on. And, they, you know, we signed contracts with them to manage, you know. They actually got us started in the bought us a little PA system. They got us a little band to back us in all the little clubs around Liverpool, things like that. You know, we started to grow, but it was only around locally, really. And then they brought in a guy called Lou Fine, who knew Tony Hall. But not only did Lou know Tony Hall, he, had, he, was, a little, he was a step above the agents that we had. He was a step above. He actually got us the audition for Opportunity Knox. While all that was going on, he also introduced us to Tony Hall. So Tony Hall sent these tracks down to see if he liked us, if he was going to be even interested. Because Tony used to manage a band called Arrival, who were also from Liverpool, who'd split up by the time we met him. And he went through a bad time, actually. Great band. They had two number. It was a number one called Friends to Guide You. You know, Friends and I Will Survive. All them, t- they, you know, it was a real yeah, 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 yeah. Great band, but they split off. So I'm just, I was just a bit starstruck that you've just sung. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I have to collect myself. <laughs> so they sent this. They sent the songs down. We we put our voice on. He actually liked them. Actually, he liked what we done. And I started phoning him. Don't you like? <laughs> Because <laughs> we didn't have a phone. We didn't own a phone at the time. I don't know how. <laughs> and I got to know him, you know, and he got to know me. And they say Scouse people are the most resilient people on the planet. They do say that. When yeah. I went for my tour around Liverpool, um, they took us all to the docks and they were saying the Scousers are the most determined, driven people on the planet. That's why yeah. you phoned him because you yeah. <laughs> yeah. grew well, up in well, Liverpool. Whatever they did, where, because... I remember one day I phoned him up and I, t- I told Elias, I said, Tony, I'm in London. Do you mind if we pop in and see him? Because I know that everybody says, can I come to London? He says, oh, he would have probably says, oh, yeah, uh, I'll be free on December. The- <laughs> 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 um, but I said, we're in London. So I had to go home, borrow the money off my mum to get on the train, went to London. And he just took a liking to, to me. You know, he, he really did. Because from Liverpool, blah, blah, blah. Before we did Opportunity Knox, he decided that he would, managers he would take us on so we got onto our our management and we said look this guy in london he wants to manage us and he used to manage a rival and blah 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 and they gave us the blessing tony just had to give them the money that they paid you know for our pa system it was a thousand pound he had to God. pay them a thousand pound which i suppose was a lot of money then a lot but very yeah. decent of them because Always they clearly lovely. saw your potential they knew yeah. that that's why they'd taken you on so they were relinquishing they were brilliant. That, but they did what was best for you, and that's yeah, so lovely. They were brilliant, you know. They knew that he could do us better, and he didn't try to hold us back. And remember, we still hadn't done Opportunity Knox. We passed the audition, but we still hadn't done it. And they could have cashed in on all that. They know that they could have cashed in on all that, you know. 
and they didn't turn them down. There was them who we had, we've got to be thankful for. There was our manager, Tony Hall, obviously, who we've got to, who was the best person I've ever met. And I wouldn't be sitting here now as the person I am without him. He was the most influential person in my life, in my life. Sadly, he died a couple of years, two years after Eddie, but nevertheless, he was the most influential person in my life. And Simon Sheridan, we owe a lot to as well, because that film has left a historical footnote for the real thing. So even when we're not here, that film will be. And there's not many acts that get an in-depth documentary. On the BBC, like on the BBC, not just, you know, on some streaming channel. I mean, it's yeah. on iPlayer. And it's been and in all the... In the cinemas so- as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were having all your screenings as COVID hit. Yeah. Because yeah. I was going to see it. Thankfully, I've now burned my iPlayer out by watching it and rewinding yeah. it and watching it. Do you think we can look forward to a re-release of that? Maybe that can go back into art house cinemas or indies or Yo, something oh, like that. You just need to see. It will do, definitely. There is definite talk of it going back in. But set up to Simon and the film company who own it. I mean, I did about six months ago, I did the Italian Film Festival featured it. And I did a Zoom with them. So, yeah, I think it's going to be definitely coming back in. There is talk about it going into the showcase cinemas. That'll be down to Simon. He'll let us know when all that's going on. I hope it does, because we mentioned Beverly Knight being just so lovely. But anyone that's ever worked with you, Chris, and met you has said you are just the loveliest person in the world. I know that personally, but I would say that's probably why you're still here, because you've just always shown such dignity and manners and respect to everyone you've worked with and you're so grateful and gratitude is the key to happiness. Why didn't you do the sort of LA thing? How come you didn't go off and do the whole Jackson 5 in Beverly Hills thing? Because you could have done. I mean, there was no reason why you didn't go off to America. We were brought up in the ghetto in Liverpool, which was community-based. All our family were there and everybody we knew were there. Because we've never even ventured to want to live in London either. Which I, that, I mean, that's it. I mean, that's your, that would have been your first step. So you, yeah. you didn't even come to London. You've no. always been in Liverpool. Yeah. And I think that's so wonderful because it is such a wonderful city. But, you know, I reckon if we cut you in half, you'd have Liverpool written. <laughs> through yeah. you. And true. I think that's what makes you, you and the real thing, the real thing. I think it's definitely part of what makes, well, it is what makes us because... When you move away, it's very easy to become separated from each other as well. With being in Liverpool, all our roots were still in Liverpool for the whole group. Like, they're all Dave's family still in Liverpool, even though, obviously, of latterly, Dave got remarried because Dave's wife died, and Dave lives in South End now. All my family is still in Liverpool, and I live about 30 miles out of Liverpool. But if you understand me, that's where me and Julie commute to. Whenever we, we're, we're doing any real shopping or anything like that, it's Liverpool, or we can go yeah. the other way to Manchester. Perfect location where you are. Yeah. You and Julie are so solid with the dogs and everything. Mm-hmm. You've been with Julie since you were really young, haven't you? Our families knew each other very, very well. For instance, Julie's first cousin was married to Eddie, and my first cousin is married to Julie's mum's brother, Oh, that's brilliant. There's nothing close in the families, but if you understand me, it's like an outside families have married in twice. I think it's lovely. My parents and Eddie, they knew Julie's mum and dad. They used to go around for dinner to Julie's dad, mum and dad, before me. And Julie got together. So, yeah, I got away with that one. (laughs) Um, But it's quite incredible that, that, you know, that the industry we're in, you're, sorry, the industry I'm wearing, the, the industry we talk about that you're in, you know, long marriages don't aren't. That's no. not normal. That's it's not, not normal. like you and yeah. Julie have broken the mold because not only have you been, you know, consistently <laughs> consistently married, but like forever. <laughs> yeah. It's that always having that root there. Yeah. What's kept us together. That's why we were never ever going to break up the group ever. We were never, ever going to say, right, you're, I'm leaving. I'm going to do my own thing or whatever. I mean, that was, it was never, ever going to come into it. You know, I mean, once me and Dave said, well, that's what we were going to do. And once we actually realised that we could do it and we turned professional, that was going to be it until 
that was going to be it. It's, uh, it's solid, solid from the very foundation, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there wasn't going to be anything to split us. And, you know, we've been through quiet times. We've had amazing highs. But, you know, with this business, I think it relies on two things, really, that determine how long you're going to be in it. And those two things are when you're hot and when you're not. When you're hot, you can do anything. But it's when you're not that determines how you're going to react to it and how long you're going to be in the business. So when you're hot great. and when you're not. So true. Yeah. That's great. Um, Those are great words, Chris. I think that's so yeah. important to remember. Mm -hmm. It all comes in a flurry when you're hot. It's how you respond when you're not. That's yeah. We've always had something to fall back on. We've been, we're a very lucky group, the real thing. Honestly, we've always been lucky. Really, it's like we've always had. I, I think it's not all luck. It's hard no, work as well. No, it's luck. It's luck. Do because, you think? Yeah, I do. Because Eddie worked just as hard as we did in his group, if not harder. But we got the luck. I mean, meeting Tony Hall. How lucky is that? That guy was so respected in this business. Yeah. You yeah. can't believe how respected he was, both here oh. and in America. And for him to land on us four guys from Liverpool. That's luck, man. Oh, Chris, you're so <laughs> humble. You're so talented. No, no, you're no, so no, humble. No, no, but listen, but... And then we've just been turned down by two prolific songwriters who said we didn't have a lead singer. A week later, a young Jewish lad walks in with you to me on everything. I mean, for God's sake, he could have gone anywhere, but he walked into our office while I was there. And that song's a classic. Now, that's luck. I mean, just say, for instance... If bit of both. Bit of both. Had, talent. Yeah, but you need luck to be able to showcase your talent. You know what I mean? You need that song to be able to sing so that people know you're talented, if you know what I mean. So you had that, right? Then you take the dogs, for instance. Well, I want to talk about the dogs because this really is an exclusive because you're never asked about the dogs in yeah. interviews talking about your music. I want you to tell people, how, how did that happen? <laughs> well, that happened because of the music business, as a matter of fact. Because... Oh, really? Oh, uh, well, I thought it was something you were ticking on with in the background. No, no it was because of the music business. What it was, when Dave and I were coming up, we used to love this um, album by a guy called Johnny Guitar Watson black American guitar player. God, he did some great songs. I'm a real mother for you. All them big hits, you know. Over and he had this um, photograph of him with Afghan Hound. And he had this another one with him in this open top car with this hat on. <laughs> and, I, and I always said to myself, when, when I make it, I'm going to have an open top car, an Afghan Hound and one of them hats. I remember we were recording Can You Feel the Force? And I was staying in the guy who wrote you to me, who was producing Field Force at the time, I was staying in his house in Essex. And he had two Afghan hounds. Well, I was in my element, wasn't I, with these Afghan hounds? It just brought everything back. The next day, we went to a kennels down there, and it was a boarding kennels or something, one of these where you can buy all breeds. And I bought the Afghan hound, took it to the studio with me. He went into the control room, stayed there all day while we were recording Can You Feel the Force? And we took him home and presented him to Julie at three o'clock in the morning. And we had him for about six months, something like that, a year. And Julie knew a guy who used to live by a mum's who had Afghan house. And he used to show them. So he took us to a show in Manchester. And I saw like 200 of these Afghan hounds all groomed to perfection. And I thought, oh, Christ, I've got to have one of them. So he introduced us to this guy who was like one of the top ones at the time. He had this picture of an Afghan hound, which is probably still one of the nicest pictures of an Afghan I've ever seen. Because the yearbook used to send you out flyers if you took an advert in, so it was a colour picture. And he says, oh, I've just had a litter. I says, oh, I want one to show because I've got the bug. I'd like to do this. When were you planning on fitting showing in around the time of Feel the Force? <laughs> yeah. So he said, well, I've just had a litter. And as I say, the guy used to live by Julie's, he said, these are the best Afghans. You know, we want, if you want to have one of them, you can have one. But all the litter died, unfortunately. So I couldn't oh, have no. one. So the same guy phoned me up. He said, there's this woman in Wales, he said. She's just had a litter. I like the mother, but I don't really like the father. But if you want to have a look, you can have a look. So we phoned her up. She said, yeah, come over. Now, what we didn't know is this woman was married to a guy called Jerry Hitchens. Who used to play for England football. So she was a bit of a celebrity. Herself. Oh, this so is brilliant. 
So she took to me straight away. You know, in other words, a lot of people, if I'd have gone to look, they go, this is just a fad, this. You can't let them. Can you imagine my mum, Chris? Can you imagine turning up? Do you work? Do you have stairs? No, you wouldn't be allowed. Yeah, you exactly. Be... <laughs> so we drove up in the open top car with the hat to this woman in Wales and they were all, the kids and that were all sitting, waiting dead excited. Because as I say, we are in the chart at the time and everything. So I went in. I picked this puppy out and she says, well, if you want this puppy, you've got to have it in partnership because that's my pick a little dog. She says, but I will let you have him if you promise me that you're going to show him. So I says, I promise you I will. And it's he's going to a stable house. I says, oh, yeah, me and Julie, we're married. Now, Julie was only 17. <laughs> right? I didn't realise Julie was so young at the time. Yeah. So I says, oh, yeah, we're married. You know, everything's fine. So, OK, she let us have him and we took him. And true to me word, you know, I went to training classes and everything and, um, did you actually? Yeah, I did. Yeah, what, I, to... I mean, what did they think when you walked in? Yeah. The lead singer of the real thing with an Afghan you know, and open a top yeah. car. I mean, it must have been the best training sessions ever. It probably was, <laughs> but I didn't notice. I was just too nervous with my dog. And um, anyway, we ended up winning a hound group of crops with that one eventually. This so is t- can I just point now? You've said that really flippantly, right? Yeah. To our listeners that aren't into dog showing, you don't just go to a class and then win the hound group at Crafts. I mean, you have to qualify to even show at Crafts, you know, because I've got listeners that are going to be real thing fans and they're not going to know. You've literally just downplayed winning a hound group at Crafts. <laughs> and I'll get in trouble for that because my mum's won one as well. Um, but you don't just win hound groups. I mean, to even get to Crafts, it's a challenge. Yeah. And then when you're at crafts, you've got to win your class and then yeah. your sex and then yeah. your breed. And Afghans are a quite popular breed. You know, there won't just be three or yeah. four. So just yeah. to sort of put this into perspective to anyone who doesn't know, Chris is a bit more than lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Am I fair in saying that? I mean, it's well, incredible. It's <laughs> not luck. You had a beautiful, incredible dog. I mean, you yeah. write everything off yeah. as luck. Man, but Meredith, the luck was getting him. It was the luck of meeting somebody like Meryl Hitchens, who was a celebrity herself because her husband played for England football, that she was sort of like a kindred spirit kind of thing. Because yeah, anyone else I can understand that. that. The best one. <laughs> it's probably not even going to be shown, you know, I mean, he's not going to have time to show, you know, my pick a litter dog. But she let, she let us have it. Anyway. A couple of years later, Julie and I got married because we weren't married then. We were just living together, right? With the consent of her parents. And we got married. Well, it was in all the papers, national papers. And Meryl phoned us up. She says, you lied to me. <laughs> she says, you told me you were married when you come to get that dog. Otherwise, I wouldn't have let you have it. Now, I'm not. Is that okay? Yeah. Now, that's luck. Come on. So there's another part where I've been very, very, very lucky. And it goes on, you know, the luck goes on. I tell you. Well, Chris won, ended up winning Crofts. Well, to breed yeah. game when you first litter that you bred, and he ends up best in show at Crofts. Come on, now, if that's not luck, what is? So you bred Gable, he ends yeah. up best in show at Crofts. I remember how you picked him up. I, I remember it's, it was such an iconic moment. And then obviously you were on Blue Peter. I mean, what a beautiful dog. We've had Afghans. And they're not easy, are they? No, they're not easy. <laughs> no, they're, not easy. And- they're easy when you when you do it to the level that Julie and I were doing it to. Julie and I could bat four Afghans, each taken three hours, and not even bat an eyelid. It, you, you just did it. And the more you did it, the easier it was. So if you bathed them twice a week, it was easier than if you bathed them once and then left them for two weeks kind of thing, you know. But it's just something that you do. But showing dogs of any breed isn't easy. No, it, it isn't. You people think it's easy, and people think they're lap dogs. They wouldn't be like they are if they were lap dogs. You can't have show dogs and have them as lap dogs because you just wouldn't get out in what you need to get out of them. What show dog is going to be lying on the couch all night in front of the fire, going to want to stand in a field full of mud? In a harding lie. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, and can I just say where my luck comes in again, Meredith? We were having a bad time. We were rolling on from Field of Force. 
10 years on. No, 10 years on from you to me or everything, not the other boss, because that was five years after you to me or everything. So we go 10 years from you to me or everything. Gable was a puppy and we won Pup of the Year. Because we won Pup of the Year, it was on every single news station, TV news station, for the whole 24 hours. Brilliant. And they played you to me as I was running around. That Brilliant. immediately put into this DJ's idea. We should re-release that. We should remix that. And that's when the company decided to remix it and it got in the top five again. It was all down to Gable. It was all down to him women winning that pop of the year and the TV coverage of it all day. You to me or everything in the background of me running around with Gable. <laughs> it's brilliant. Well, you couldn't get more publicity on a record no. that was very popular. Could you? So 10 and- years on, it became top five again. Oh, well, that, that's lovely for royalties as well. I mean, dog, dog showing is cutthroat. Do you think that's really what's kept you grounded? Because people will say the music industry is hard. I think you can survive anything if you've been in the dog world. You really, I, from, I, I watch it from, from a spectator's point yeah. of view. And I mean, it's more drama than Crossroads goes on yeah. in the dog world. It's fascinating. I love it. You keep yourself very much out of it. But I think yeah. you can't really be a pop star in the dog world because you're, you're judged by your dogs. And if your dogs are shit, no one's going to bother with you. I mean, that's so it just goes to show the quality of your dogs. You know, the world of dogs, I know you said you found a kindred spirit with Hitchin's wife, but in all honesty, that doesn't phase the dog world, do they? The doyens of the, if you've got a good dog, you've got a good dog and it doesn't matter what your background. I mean, I don't know, maybe it's changed, but <laughs> there's no, there's no, there doesn't seem to be any room for celebrity in the show ring, does there? And if you've got a good dog, well, you're going to win. You know what it is? <laughs> It works both ways because being a celebrity, certainly a known celebrity, like probably I was one of probably the only black people that show. Well, I was going to say that was more the fact that you were a black handler. I would say it was more in at that time and probably to a certain extent. Now it's still quite a white, isn't it? So actually that was almost weirder, if that's the right word, than the fact you were a pop star. Yeah. Well, as, as a child, that, you know, the fact that I was both people say it does help you. It does help you when everybody knows you. But equally, you've got to have a better specimen. And I'll tell you why. If you are just a, a normal exhibitor and you've got a lot of judges walking around the show, walking around, stop and look at a time when a class is getting judged of Afghans. And there might be someone in there with a dog that gets placed last in the class. And there might be judges outside the ring who are coming up to judge the breed in a week or two. Whereas if that was me stood at the end of the lineup and they see me getting thrown out a couple of times, they're coming up to judge, they'd know before they went on me, oh, I remember, yeah, yeah, he's, I've seen him getting thrown out a couple of times. Oh, it doesn't always work in your favour. Can't be a very good dog, that. And basically, you're done for, <laughs> aren't you, basically? Yeah. If the aren't doing you well, because if your dog isn't good enough, right? So, and you're not doing well, people remember that you're not doing well because they remember you. But if you're just a normal white exhibitor, right? Yeah. Going in, you get yeah. thrown out all the time. You get these judges coming up who know not, who don't know a lot. They don't know that can't be a good dog. I've seen it getting thrown out last week or whatever. So basically, they are looking differently at the dog because they don't know it. Yeah. But, you know, as I say, you can help you both ways because if they see you winning every week, they remember, you know, if you're a celebrity and they see you winning every week, you go, well, yeah, I remember him. He won there, won there, won there, he's won there, he's won there, he's won this. Must be a good dog. You know, so it, it works both for people are only human. If you see a dog winning every week, I don't care who you are, I don't care what judge you are, you're going to give it a second look. Of course. And that's, the, and that's all you can ask. Then it's down to the judge's knowledge as to what they do with that second look. But I can assure you, if they see you winning every week, they give you a second look. I mean, I know, obviously, the music accolades are incredible. Do you think for you, winning Crufts with a dog you bred and everything that came with it was probably something that you remember as just one of the pinnacles in, in your life? Because it's, it's incredible. There's no feeling like Two pinnacles in my life. Number one hit and winning Best in Show Crufts. They're the two. Keeping on with dogs, Crufts is coming up. Yeah. Are you entering, judging, showing what's happening at Crufts? And if you haven't got Afghans, have you got wolfhounds at Crufts? Yes, I have 
got my two wolfhounds at Crufts this year. I always try to do Crufts. I always like to do Crufts. I just love the show. And sometimes, you know, you're, you're excited, depending on who's judging, and sometimes you're not. But you're always excited about the show itself. And even if I'm not showing, if, if it wasn't showing, I would probably try and get there. It's a great atmosphere. Great. Yeah, it's and brilliant. discover dogs. If if you're looking to get a dog, and I think mm-hmm. we shouldn't we shouldn't all just decide on getting a dog because we want a sports car and an Afghan. <laughs> okay. You could go you could go to Discover Dogs and see all these incredible dogs. It's the best way, I think, to decide decide to get a dog, isn't it? Because you're talking to the breeders and to the people that have bought. And I would strongly recommend going to Discover Dogs, go to the hounds, go and see the Afghans and the wolf hounds, because that's when you get the real... Get a good feel whether the dog is right for you, whether you're going to like the dog and things, yeah. And you see them close up, you see how big they're actually going to be. Yes. You know, it's like, Your okay, wolf hounds are... It's okay seeing cute little puppies, but, you know, you've got to take into consideration, well, you know, when they're like small donkeys, you know, is it going to be able to walk around me flat kind of thing? My daughter said to me the other day, do you think um, Chris would let me have a wolf hound? And I went, Millie, yeah. you live in a student house in Kensington, Liverpool. I don't think Chris is going to let you have a wolf hound puppy. <laughs> <laughs> So we can see you at Crufts and hopefully, is Crufts looking, I know you just go for the show, but is it promising this year, potentially? Are you allowed to say? <laughs> I never know whether we're allowed to talk about dog you know, shows like that. You know something, I always consider shows are promising because we both believe how good our dogs are. And basically, we just hope that judges see what we see in the dogs. I know how good our dogs are and we just yeah. hope that judges see for themselves, how good they are, you know. So, yeah, I would say that most shows that we go to are promising, but I must add to that, there are plenty of other people who go to the show thinking the same thing because they've got good dogs as well. But, you know, you just got to know how good your dogs are. Well, your dogs are magnificent and we'll put all the links um, in, in the show notes. Do you ever have handlers? Or do you no. are you completely hands-on, the pair of you? Yeah, just me and Julie, hands-on. And touring and writing albums. Yep. How did you do it? How? I've done it too long, Meredith. I've done it too long. It's something that I've always done. I've always had to fit them both in. And there's always time to fit them both in, you know. I mean, obviously, you ca- I can't do as many shows as a lot of people can do. Basically, I just have to be very, very careful at the beginning of the year. Like, I'm planning for next year because... All gigs are coming in a year or two in advance. That's good news. And That's uh, brilliant. And your mum will tell you. So she tells me. I mean, I remember uh, I went under your mum. Your mum was judging. And it was in Bournemouth. And Julie and I travelled all the way to Bournemouth. And we won. You know, we had a good win. And we couldn't stay to represent the breed in the group because I was working that night in Yorkshire. Oh, yeah. no. So my mum didn't have an so, entry in the hound group. So she didn't have an entry. But she understood, you know. But I mean, your mum was just pleased that I'd bothered to travel all that way there. Well, yeah, it's no, I just travel all that way back, you know. But that's what I have to do sometimes. Sometimes I have to just go to the show, support the judge, and then just get off. I can't stay for the hand because so it, it really understand that sometimes I can't stay. So it really isn't about the winning the the, the best in show. It's about the taking yeah. part, being with the people, yes. being with your dogs. Yeah, and that is the right reason. Yeah, absolutely. I like showing my dogs. It I get a lot of enjoyment out of it, and. In the years when the group aren't doing well and the dogs are, you still come home smiling. You, you, you're still having things to celebrate. And while you're celebrating, you're writing nice songs because you feel happy. And, you know, it, it, it's just, it's all. It's therapy, it's Chris. It sounds like it's your therapy almost. It is, yeah. It is. I need both. That's lovely. Yeah. That is because I think so many musicians, when they come off tour, Mm-hmm. That's when they can spiral into all sorts of things, you know, be yeah. it drugs or. or yeah. But if you've got something going on all the time to the point where you're moving tours around dog shows, yeah. it's that's why that's the trick. You see, everyone needs to get a dog, and you know, I, I love my dogs. I wouldn't be without yeah. dogs. I don't trust people that don't like dogs. So the new album, you're going to tour to promote the new album. When does that kick off? Are you doing all the summer festivals? Where can we find? all the information so that we can come and follow you at dog shows and concerts and everywhere. Yeah. www.realthingofficial.com 
that's got all our dates on. And also, it's good to check in with that because with a lot of shows getting cancelled at various times, I don't think that will happen so much this year, but there's still cancellations. That keeps them up to date. Also, you can follow us on Facebook as well, which is great because we put a lot on Facebook. I do a lot of question and answers on video. Oh, do you? And, and Facebook Lives, they're brilliant. Yeah. yeah. So on Twitter, you know, yeah. You and all- Instagram. You always forget about Instagram, Chris. I'm not on Instagram. You're the real thing, are? Are you sure? It says the real thing official and it's got a blue tick. That's not me. He's too young to be me. <laughs> it's a it's great me, photo. <laughs> It's me, it's me. <laughs> That's a great photo. So just, just to clarify, so everyone can find you, you are on Instagram. Okay. It's um, the real thing official. Okay. <laughs> Chris is on Instagram, Thanks but he doesn't know. Me. Thanks for telling me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to check that band out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who are they? They're okay. very good and they've got your album. <laughs> okay, That's the important no. thing. They've got a blue tick, so they must be. It must be someone at your label or somewhere. No, <laughs> no, don't you worry. I told you I wasn't into all this technology, didn't I? No, I know, but it's Facebook. wonderful. It's why I love you so much because that's yeah. you are just you're you're this amazing pop star who's written just incredible stuff, and then you show dogs with my mum, and she just adores yeah. you, and it's just you're just great. Do you know what I loved just before lockdown? Or was it during lockdown? Did you do? wasn't Pebble Miller at one because that hasn't been around since forever, but you did, you sang outside, was it? Yes. Yeah, this, you was swimming good, that, or this, this morning? This morning. Ruth, Eamon and Ruth. Yeah. And they were mega fans, weren't yeah. they? Ruth's a mega yeah. fan. This morning TV had been fantastic with the real thing to say. We must have been on there four or five times during lockdown and they really want to feature the album as well, which is, I think is really nice because it's very, very difficult when you haven't got a record company. You know, yes, the, and you haven't done you yeah. haven't done hard copies, have you? Chris was explaining to we me have. earlier that this is we, all we, digital. We, it's all digital at the moment for buying it, the album at the moment, but there will be hard copies. Available. Oh, good. There will be, but because the artwork's ama- the artwork's amazing. Yeah. You should yeah. you need to. I've downloaded it on Apple. It's on Apple Music. We need to give a shout out to the quad. I'm going to say it wrong. The quadrilogy. You're going to have to say it. Quadrilogy. Quadrilogy, yeah, uh, quarter, yeah. You, I mean, big shout out. But the album is a masterpiece. And if someone put a gun to my head and said, "What era was this released in?" Mm-hmm. I'd be like, "I don't know. It's just beautiful. Mm-hmm. It's classic. It could be 2022. It could be 1970s." It, Chris, it's brilliant. Okay. And I, I'm going to make sure everyone I know has heard a copy because okay. I'm I'm so proud of it and to know nice. you and, and I just think it's brilliant. So thank you so much for coming on because you are the busiest man in the world. Thank you so much, Chris. That was absolutely brilliant. I loved every second of that. Good luck at Crafts. We'll be watching and listening to that incredible new album, A Brand New Day, which is available to download everywhere. And thank you so much to you, the listeners. Thank you for following, subscribing, downloading and reviewing. You've been absolutely amazing. I can't wait to be back in two weeks' time. This episode is dedicated to Eddie Amu.